Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. You can reach us on the phones at 559-656-0317 and call or text that number. Or you can send us an email to questions at insurancehour.com. If you would like to get on our text group, go ahead, shoot us a text to 567-4-CARL. That's 567-367-5275. Today, we are taking your calls and more importantly, not more, as importantly, we are going through emails. I have probably about 80 emails that I'm behind in going over questions from people. And I wanted to just jump right into those today. So again, if you do want to get on the air, Go ahead and give us a call, 559-656-0317. Or, I, meanwhile, I will just jump right in and go through the questions. Are you ready? Here we go. We have Jennifer in Seattle. Of course, I just have to say sleepless in Seattle. I can't help it. Hello, I've been a homeowner in Seattle for over a decade with all the talk about the potential of a major earthquake in our area. I'm considering adding earthquake insurance to my policy. However, I'm unsure if it's worth the high premiums. Can you explain what earthquake insurance typically covers and whether it's a good investment given the risks? Okay, uh, that's terrific, Jennifer. Thanks for the question. You know, when you hear about earthquakes, you don't typically think about Seattle. You think about California, right? Oddly enough, we are starting to have tremors pretty much everywhere, whether they're small or large. So you will find insurance companies offering earthquake insurance. Actually, our sponsor for today's show is actually an earthquake insurance provider. That's GeoVera. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I I would have to tell you that this is my general thought on earthquake insurance. If you live in an area where there are earthquakes, then you need to consider earthquake insurance. What happens is you have to decide if the premium is worth the risk, right? What you can do is if you tend to be in an area that doesn't see a lot of earthquake activity, and Seattle probably falls into that category, then the premium you would probably be paying for an earthquake insurance policy is probably pretty low. So it's probably not too tough a decision to make if it's a matter of, you know, a handful of lattes a month in premium. Probably makes sense to go ahead, get that coverage just so you do have that protection. In the event there is an earthquake, you don't want to be left having to deal with it really on your own. And that's what it comes down to, right? If there's an earthquake and you have damage, you either have insurance coverage or you have to out of pocket those expenses. So obviously, if you're in an area that is prone to earthquakes, such as California, then absolutely, you want to look to have earthquake insurance for sure. Next question, we have Robert from Miami. He says, hi there. I recently purchased a home that's located in a designated flood zone. My lender is requiring me to buy flood insurance, but I'm confused because I thought my standard homeowner's insurance would cover flooding. Why isn't flood damage included? And what should I look for when choosing a flood insurance policy? Hi, Robert. Uh, I will give the disclaimer that this uh, this question came in prior to the terrible hurricane that's recently uh, hit our southeast. Now, Robert, flood insurance is a separate policy. It's excluded. Flood damage is excluded from all property insurance policies. So if you buy a homeowner's insurance policy or a renter's policy or a condominium owner's policy, it's going to exclude damage by flood. Flood is available two ways, one through the National Flood Insurance Program, and that is a government agency through FEMA. And you're able to purchase flood insurance through the private industry, meaning there are private insurance companies that will actually offer flood insurance, just like they'll offer home insurance or auto insurance, they'll write flood insurance. The coverages will vary, but typically the standard flood policy you'll look at will give you coverage for up to $250,000 for the structure and $100,000 for personal property. If that's sufficient for you, then that's probably the standard policy you're looking for. It can be relatively inexpensive depending on where you are to relatively expensive, again, depending on where you are. Similar to the earthquake insurance question that we just had, understand that if you're in an area that is prone to having a particular type of loss, then your premium is going to reflect that, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're expected to have more claims, if the potential of having a loss is higher, the premium is going to be higher as well. It kind of makes sense, right? That tracks, as my kids would say. So flood insurance, something you can get individually by a private company or through FEMA, through the National Flood Insurance or um, organization. And if you do wanna get a National Flood Insurance organization policy through FEMA, you can get that from an insurance agent or broker. They will write it through that program for you. Okay, doke. Moving on, we have Jason in New York City. 
not just New York, but New York City. I always have to laugh because I saw this funny picture once that said that people outside of New York, they picture New York as Manhattan. That's it. Like New York is Manhattan. And as we know, New York is actually quite a bit larger than that. And it's not all Manhattan. Anyway, Jason says, I occasionally let my roommate borrow my car to run errands. I'm surprised you have a car in New York. Uh, oh, see, I did it myself. I'm thinking Manhattan. Uh, I let my roommate borrow my car to run errands. If he gets into an accident while driving my car, whose insurance would cover the damages, mine or his? I'm worried about how this might affect my premium. That's a fair question. Auto insurance will typically follow the registered owner of the vehicle first and then the driver second. So if you're letting your roommate drive your car, more than likely, if there's an accident that's involved, your insurance company would step up first. And in the event that you either are uninsured or don't have sufficient insurance, then the driver's insurance would kick in next. So you are correct in being concerned about letting someone drive your car and how that may impact your premium because it can. If they go and cause an accident that's going to be their fault or there's damage that's caused, your insurance company steps up and pays, that more than likely will affect your insurance premium. Moving on, we have Emily in Denver, we are all over the place. Uh, I'm considering getting an umbrella insurance policy because I have assets I want to protect. Can you explain how umbrella insurance works in conjunction with my existing home and auto policies? At what point is it advisable to get one? I think it's important for me to point something out that it, it appears that Emily already knows. When you get an umbrella insurance policy, some people think that that will cover on top of all of your insurance, period. If you don't have enough home insurance, it'll pay. If you don't have enough car insurance, it'll pay. That's not what an umbrella insurance policy does. An umbrella insurance policy is liability insurance, okay? It's going to pay for liability-related damages. So in the event that there's a, let's say, slip and fall, your homeowner's policy pays, and then it runs out of coverage, your umbrella liability would kick in. If there's a large accident that you're involved in, and you exhaust the limits on your auto policy, then the umbrella policy again would kick in and pay the additional liability exposure that you have. This is not for anything other than liability insurance. Umbrella actually is a bit of a misleading term if you think about it, because I can understand why people would think it covers on top of everything. It's everything liability related, not everything, everything, okay? Now I wanna talk about Emily's question, Emily, right? Yes, and one of these questions when we come back from a quick break and talk about when I advise people look to get it and you know if, if there's a trigger point when it has to be gotten. Again, this is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman. Appreciate you being here with us. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. We will be back with your questions and emails in one minute. See you then. Let's talk about earthquakes for a minute. Look, we know we live in earthquake country here in California. Powerful, devastating earthquakes have happened here before, and science says that they will happen again. They can't tell us exactly when, they can just tell us that it is going to happen. Count on it, prepare for it. Did you know that earthquakes are not covered by your homeowner's insurance policy? You need a separate policy to give you the peace of mind that you will be able to recover without getting financially wiped out the next time we get hit with a big one. There is a great company here in California that will provide you with earthquake coverage you need at a price you can afford. That company is GeoVera. I have a policy through GeoVera. I really like how easy it is to choose from all of their great coverage options, backed by the financial strength that lets me know that they will be here for me when I need them the most. Go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour to learn more. That's getquake.com slash insurance hour. Make sure you're ready for the day when the ground shakes again. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you for being here. You can give us a call, 559-656-0317. Send a call, a call, send a call. Call or text that number. Also, you can send us an email to questions at insurancehour.com. You want to join our text group, go right ahead. Go ahead and send a text to 567 for carl That's 567-367-5275. We are taking your emailed questions today, and there are a lot of them. Before the break, we were talking about an umbrella policy that Emily from Denver had emailed in about. Again, make sure if you missed the part about what an umbrella covers, go grab the show online. Just search for Insurance Hour. You can find it on YouTube or iHeartMedia, TuneIn, Amazon Alexa, whatever it might be. You'll find us out there. Just look for Insurance Hour. So when do we advise getting an umbrella policy? In general, in the insurance industry, there's two ways of looking at it. Some people will say, well, 
You want to get an umbrella policy anytime you have more assets to protect than your primary or your underlying liability coverage will provide for, right? So let's say you have half a million dollars of liability on your home insurance and you have assets excess of that. Then people will say, well, you must get an umbrella policy then. It's one way of looking at it and it's not wrong. However, I look at it a little more globally, a little bit more holistically maybe is the right word to use. Liability insurance is the buffer that keeps your stuff, whether it be your income, your assets, your property, whatever it might be, from somebody else that's suing you for negligence. Okay, so in the event that you have someone that comes after you for some type of large litigation, some type of large loss that you are being sued for, for being negligent for causing, it might be that, well, you don't necessarily have that much in the bank liquid or you or your house might not be worth $2 million, let's say. But at the end of the day, if you're found liable and you don't have enough liability insurance, then in litigation, again, disclaimer, not an attorney, in litigation, people can have their assets attached. And what that means is the court might find that, well, you owe, let's just pretend a million dollars and your insurance policy pays half a million. Therefore, you owe a half a million dollars. That means that the person that's suing you potentially might be able to have a lien against your future income. So I don't think that it's necessarily just a matter of how much in assets do you have to protect today. It's just about how much protection, how much of a buffer do you want to have between you, your income, your stuff, and what somebody else might be suing you for. So umbrella insurance, again, something that I am a, quite a big fan of because I think that after at the end of the day, when we think about insurance, we think about lawsuits and we think about, yeah, let's be as protected as we can. So hopefully that answers your question. Moving on, you know, I'm looking at all the different places these questions came in from. I think that my uh, my team must have gone through and deliberately picked somebody from every state or at least not as many people from uh, one state. But all of this information is, for the most part, it works no matter where you live. So the next one is Raj and he's in Chicago and he says, last year, I filed a claim on my homeowner's insurance after a small kitchen fire. Now, my premium has increased significantly. Is it normal for rates to go up after a claim? Are there ways to prevent such increases or shop around for better rates after filing a claim? You know, we had an entire show or at least an entire segment of a show uh, not too long ago talking about how is it and why is it that you might be claim free for years and years and years, decades even, you have a claim and all of a sudden your rate goes up and how that doesn't feel right. I don't want to get into the details of that again because we covered it in a previous show. Jump online and check for it if you want. In general, here's how it works. When you have a loss, as in this case he has, he's had a kitchen fire. Now the insurance company is looking at that and saying, hmm, okay, this is someone that has had a fire loss. This is something that they've had happen. So are they more likely to have it happen again? Arguably, are they more likely to have it happen than someone who's never had a fire in their kitchen? And statistically, the numbers say yes. So it's not at all a surprise. It's not unheard of. It's actually commonplace. If you have a claim, depending on what the claim is, of course, the insurance carrier is going to at renewal when they have that opportunity to look at your, your past history and, and make a decision as to whether they want to insure you or what they want to charge you to, to be insured. And they have to make a decision. They have to decide how much or if they want to insure you and you're going to be looking at that kitchen fire in that determination. As far as shopping around goes, absolutely. It's always a good idea to shop around. It's always good to have your independent agent or broker see if there are other options for you. Understand that when they do that, they're going to have to disclose that you have had that claim as well. Now, some insurance companies might be more forgiving of claims than others, it just depends. So it's still worthwhile to shop if you can. I, I, my general generic, and um, suggestion, recommendation, call it what you will, is if next you're looking to save significant dollars and you've tried everything with your current carrier, moving from one insurer to another, especially right after a claim, tends to not be always the best move. Again, unless there's a significant reason to do it. All right, that's Raj, let's move on. Next we have Karen in Dallas. She says, I run a small baking business out of my home kitchen and customers pick up orders from my house. Do I need a separate business insurance policy or will my homeowner's insurance policy cover any potential liabilities or property damage related to my business? Very smart. These are some really sharp questions that I'm getting. Now, I'm, as I'm reading this, you know, all the red flags are going off in my head, right? 
First, she's running a business out of home. Second, she has customers come into her house. All these things are red flags because homeowner's insurance is designed, it's a package, right? And it's designed to insure people and their houses. A homeowner's policy can't know if that person decides to start running a bakery. It can't know if all of a sudden they decide to start uh, open up a tax firm. It's not designed for that. So it's not priced for it and the coverage types that it has aren't appropriate as well. The short answer, is anything I ever say a short answer, I'll try. The short answer is yes, you absolutely do need to get additional insurance. Homeowners policies not only will not provide the proper liability coverage and property damage and, and those things for your bakery business, but on top of it, they may specifically exclude any type of damage caused by the business. So if you're baking and there's an oven fire in the kitchen, your homeowner's policy might say, well, you know what? That was a business exposure. We didn't know that was there. Homeowner's policies don't pay for business related things. They might de decline that entire claim. So if you have a business in your home, regardless of what type of business it is, it is critical that you do get insurance for that business. The fact that you have people actually coming to your house even more so, because again, your homeowner's insurance policy is not designed and will likely not trigger any type of coverage for someone that might come to your house. They might trip on your front door. Maybe your dog bites them on the ankle, who knows? You need to know that homeowner's policies, again, are designed for an individual and a home. And business is just not part of what the product's designed for. So if you're running a business, get a business policy. You're right for asking. And that's because you probably realize that, yeah, this is, this is a potential change from what things used to be. Change means review your insurance policy. So I would suggest you talk with your insurance agent or broker, find out what type of business insurance coverage options are available. Time for another quick break and back to your questions. This is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman. We will be back in 60 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the magic podcast show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Gray. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the WindowToTheMagic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. We are taking your calls. Give us a call, 559-656-0317. You can call or text that number or shoot a question over via email to questions at insurancehour.com. If you're looking to get insurance updates as they happen, join our group at, uh, go to our text group that is, send a text to 5674-CARL, that's 567-F-O-R-K-A-R-L. Yes, it's Carl with a K, 567-367-5275. If you've missed any part of this show, we've been going through questions that people have emailed in jump online and go find it. You can find it uh, anywhere online. Just go to insurancehour.com. You can check on Apple Podcasts. You can check on YouTube. You can go to iHeartMedia, TuneIn, Spotify, you name it, we're, we're out there. Good stuff today. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, we have from Alex in Portland. Portland, Alex says, I'm reviewing my homeowner's insurance and noticed options for replacement costs versus actual cash value coverage for my belongings. What is the difference between these two and which one offers better protection in case I need to file a claim? Again, these are these are spot on questions. All right. Replacement cost versus actual cash value. Now he's talking about specifically how it impacts his personal property. So let's address that. Let's say there's a loss and he's filing a claim for his television and for his computer. Let's just say those two things were damaged. If he has a replacement cost policy, the insurance company is going to say, okay, go purchase your new television, go purchase your new computer, and we're going to pay up to policy limits for 
replacing those items. It's replacement cost, the cost to replace, right? Make sense? Actual cash value says, okay, well, that was a five-year-old TV. It's probably worth about a dollar. I'm kidding. Five-year-old TV is probably worth a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, who knows? Not a lot, right? That's all they're going to pay you. Same thing for the computer. Well, how old, how long, um, what's the actual cash value? What's the value of a five-year-old laptop? Probably not a lot. That's what they're going to pay you. Very, very, very different way of settling a claim. We actually did an entire show on claims and settling claims. If you missed it, it's a great one. It was with a special guest, Rachel Goldman. If you go online and search for Insurance Hour Claims Interview or Insurance Hour Rachel, you'll probably find it. Good show. This is one of those things. It's important for people to understand what it is and how claims are settled. Replacement cost is what you typically want to have, right? You are not looking to have a loss and have the insurance company depreciate what you've had lost. And then at the end of the day, say, here's what it was worth. Here's all you get. You're looking to repurchase it, right? That's what you want. That's typically what we think about when we think about insurance. I lose something, something's damaged, whatever the case may be, I get a new one. That's what you're looking for. Sometimes in the business we call replacement cost new for old. Even though it's a five-year-old television, we're going to pay you to buy a new television, right? In some ways it seems wrong because you're not supposed to be better off than you were after a claim as you were before. But in this, in this regard, carriers are not going to say, okay, go find yourself a five-year-old TV and we'll pay for it. They're going to say, we're gonna replace the TV, go get it and we'll pay for that amount for a new TV. Now, as I just indicated, if they were to say, go find a five-year-old TV, which they don't, we'll pay you for it, actual cash value would be the amount that they pay. Make sense? So yes, you definitely wanna look for replacement costs where you can and be sure that you see it on your policy and if not, ask why, because you probably think it's there even if it's not. Next question we have from Sophie in Atlanta. My agent suggested adding uninsured motorist coverage to my auto policy but I already have comprehensive and collision coverage. Do I really need uninsured motorist? And what are the benefits it provides that aren't already covered? Is he trying just to charge me more? Okay, auto insurance is a great type of coverage because it's very granular. You can pick and choose what type of coverage you get. It's one of the reasons that it's frustrating or difficult in our industry when someone says, I want full coverage. Well, what's full coverage? Is it absolutely everything? What about deductible? So let's start from this. Competent collision for the vehicle is going to cover damage to the vehicle that you have. Collision coverage is going to pay for damage to your vehicle while the vehicle is in motion. Comprehensive coverage is going to pay for damage to the vehicle while the vehicle is not in motion. It also includes things like fire and theft, somebody walking by and keying the car. You know what? Can people do that anymore? Everybody has key fobs. How do you key somebody's car? I don't understand, all of a sudden, this is mind blowing to me. But you understand the difference now between physical damage, between comp and collision, so you have that. Uninsured motorist is a totally different coverage type. In the event you have an accident with someone and that other person does not have insurance or doesn't have sufficient insurance to pay for your injury or your damages, then uninsured motorist would step in to do that. Totally different coverage than just having physical damage coverage on your automobile. Uninsured motorist coverage is such an important type of coverage that in some states, such as California, I know off the top of my head, there is a specific form that the Department of Insurance mandates you sign either accepting uninsured motorist or specifically declining it. That's how important it is. Pretty important stuff, right? There are people out there that are driving uninsured, not so good. And there are people that are driving around out there with low limits of liability or, or in general, not enough coverage to pay for damage they might be inflicting. So uninsured motorist and, or it's called sometimes uninsured and underinsured motorist. And again, footnote, sometimes it's sold separately, rarely, but it is. So you definitely want to find out if your policy covers uninsured and or uninsured motorist coverage. It's something you want to have because people do drive around uninsured and they do drive around with small policies. And let's face it, cars are expensive, medical care is expensive. You wanna be sure that if you have an accident, which is bad enough, the last thing you wanna to have to start dealing with is medical bills and who's going to pay. There's not enough money to pay for your car and things like that. All right, Carlos in San Diego. I'm planning a major home renovation that includes adding a second story. Should I notify my homeowner's insurance company before starting the work? 
How might this renovation affect my insurance premium? Oh, Carlos, this is a juicy one. I love this. This is probably one of the most overlooked issues that happens. People think they can make changes to their home and somehow it just doesn't affect their insurance policy. Let's, if you stop for a second, we're going to go into detail about this right after the break, but think about this over the break. If a policy is covering your house the way it is today, how is it that if you're doing things, for, in this example, adding a second story, how would it not make sense that your insurance policy would need to be changed? Similarly, do you think that maybe there are different exposures happening while people are doing work on your house? If there's a crane lifting parts, if there are heavy duty equipment that's on your property, if there's all sorts of stuff going on during construction, does that sound like the same typical type of risk exposure that you would have just owning and living in your home? Spoiler alert, no, it's different. So let's talk about it in a little more detail after the break. This is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman, and we will be back in only 60 seconds. See you then. Have you been dropped by your insurance agency or seen your premium skyrocket? Sussman Insurance is here to help. We are a family owned and operated insurance agency that's been serving our community for two generations. At Sussman Insurance, we know how stressful it can be to find the right coverage, especially when prices go up or you're left without insurance. That's why we're committed to finding you competitive rates, whether it's for fire, home, earthquake, flood, auto insurance, you name it, we've got you covered. Give us a call or send a text to 310-820-5200 or visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com. Plus, Stay updated on all things insurance by joining our text group. Just text 567-4CARL with a K. That's 567-367-5275 to get the latest updates straight to your phone. Sussman Insurance, your family's insurance solution. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Call or text that number. Send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. You want to join our text group, go right ahead. Send us a text to 5674-CARL. That's 567-367-5275. Send us a nice text. Don't be obnoxious. By the way, the text group is not updated very often. There's only information being sent out if there's something very time related or significant happening. We're not sending information. Hey, this company is leaving. Hey, this company is changing their rate. No, this is for very specific, important information. Here we are back answering your questions. If you've missed any part of this show, jump online, go look for it. Just go to insurancehour.com or just check on YouTube or iHeartMedia, TuneIn, Alexa, Spotify, wherever you listen to your stuff, we're, we are there. Also, before I go on, I wanna thank our sponsor for being so good to us, to this channel, GeoVera Insurance Company. I have earthquake insurance with GeoVera, and as you can imagine, I could get my earthquake insurance pretty much everywhere. Every carrier wants to have the brokers that write the insurance with them. They want them to be able to say what I'm saying right now, which is, well, I have my insurance there. I choose to have my insurance with GeoVera, and actually I have for probably 20 plus years, maybe even more. I like them. The coverage is good, the rates are good, the financial solvency is excellent. So if you don't have earthquake insurance, you wanna get a quote, see what the rates look like, they've changed. There's a lot more flexibility on deductibles as well. Just go to getquake.com forward slash insurance hour. Again, it's getquake.com forward slash insurance hour. And just take a peek, see what the rates look like, because I think you might be surprised, especially because there are so many different deductibles to choose from. You might realize that, oh my gosh, I can actually afford this, or this makes sense because it's only for something catastrophic. So again, we thank GeoVera for their support. Before the break, we were talking uh, about Carlos in San Diego, who is doing some home renovation. Now let's talk about it. Home renovation, he's adding a second story. So first of all, again, go back to that same concept that I mentioned. Home policies are designed very generically, people living in a house. Mic drop. Now, someone doing construction on their house, that's different. That's not something that happens to everybody. If it did, then the policy would cover it and the price would be adjusted accordingly. So when you're going to be doing work on your house, there are basically two stages to be aware of. One 
when you're doing the work and second, when you're done with the work. When you're doing the work, reach out to your agent and broker, tell them what the work is that's being done. Depending on the insurance company, you may need a separate policy. You may need to make an endorsement, fancy name for change, to your existing policy. It just depends on the insurance company. But I can promise you, you're not going to do nothing. <laughs> you ain't doing nothing because there's a different exposure, especially when you're looking to add a second story to a house. The second part is when the work is complete, because guess what? I know you know this. If you're putting money in having work done on your home, that's going to increase the value of replacing your home by probably at least what you just paid to do it, right? If you paid a quarter of a million dollars to do renovations on your home, well, you probably are going to want to insure your home for that much more money because if there's a loss, you just put all that money in. You want to be sure that whatever you did to the house, there's sufficient coverage in there to do it. Replacement cost values are a big deal. Be sure that you take as much time as you can, work with as many tools as you can and people as you can, even get in, get some estimates from licensed contractors, provide them to your agent or broker if you want to, and let them see what the actual replacement cost is going to be. Don't just guess. Don't just go about and say, well, one estimator thinks it's going to be X dollars a square foot and just move forward. Everyone's home is different. Everyone's home is different. A wise agent said to me once, many, many years ago, he said, you know what? It doesn't matter how much insurance you have when there's a claim, there's just never enough. Really un unfortunate, but somehow it, it feels true, right? When there's a claim, you just feel like you want to not have to worry about how much coverage you have. So when you're doing work on a home, and this is the next obvious question, well, at what point during the construction do I need to increase my home value? Again, talk to your agent or broker, depending on if you're adding something to your existing policy or purchasing another policy, you want to be sure that you have protection throughout the construction time, not just on day one and not just when everything is completely done. You want to be sure that you have coverage throughout the entire time period. Renovations, work done on your home, talk to your agent or broker. It's important. Don't assume, oh, if I don't tell them everything, I'll just be okay, right? I'll ask for forgiveness and not permission. Not going to happen. That doesn't work with insurance companies. If you have a policy, and it, which is basically a contract with an insurance company, and it says we're not going to pay if you're doing X, Y, and Z, and you say, ah, I just won't tell them I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and they'll pay for it if there's a claim. Not going to happen. All right. And again, we're not talking about tons of money either, by the way. Unless you're doing something massive, you're tearing your house down to the studs, and you're going to be doing work, then you might be looking at a significant premium because, again, you're doing significant work. Believe me, the amount you're going to pay for the type of policy that you need is a fraction compared to what you're probably spending on the house itself. All right. Did I beat that one enough? Let's move on to the next question. Uh, this is Olivia in Boston. Since the pandemic, I've been working from home and rarely drive anywhere. Well, it's kind of sad. Should I inform my auto insurance company about this change or not? Will it help my premium? First of all, the answer, the short answer again is yes. Uh, vehicle usage is a large part of how insurance companies will determine what your premium is, a large, large part, which makes sense. Someone that drives a ton is going to be on the road more and has more exposure than someone who does not drive a lot. Makes a lot of sense. So if you're working from home, you wanna be sure that your insurance carrier knows that and they adjust your rate accordingly. Because let's just say in the past, you used to be a I'm going to date myself and say door-to-door -door salesman. You might have been doing a lot of driving. And if you're doing a lot of driving, you're on the road a lot, then the insurance premium was going to reflect that. If you're not driving as much on the road, you're less of an exposure because you have less likelihood of having an accident and your rate will reflect that as well. So definitely, Olivia, reach out to your insurance company and let them know, say, hey, I am not driving my car that much. Here's my odometer reading. You want to compare it to the last time I had my odometer checked? By the way, that's a great way of saving money with a lot of insurance companies. You might just call and say, hey, I'm driving less, charge me less. And they're going to say, uh, how do we know? So if you're able to give an insurance company two points in time where they can see your odometer reading, maybe you went to have your oil changed and you've got the receipt or something along those lines of service for your car. And that was a few months ago. And you can provide that to your insurance company along with maybe a picture of your current odometer. Then they can look at that, do a little bit of math and say, hmm, now I have an idea of how much this car is being driven. That could potentially save you a lot of money on your car insurance. 
We talked about ways to save money on insurance in a previous episode as well. If you want, just jump online and search for it. Look for insurance hour, how to save money, or insurance hour, auto discounts, something like that. We're going to talk about that and more right after a quick break. This again is Insurance Hour. I'm your host, Carl Sussman, and we will see you in just 60 seconds. Back then. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, in just a few moments, the window to the Magic Podcast Show will begin. My name is Patrick. My name is Calvin. I'm Mouseketeer Greg. My name is Paul, and I will be your guide through the wonderful world of Disney sound experiences. This show is a weekly trip into the world of the Disney theme parks and resorts. And this is the place where you get to use your ears to surround yourself with the magic. For your safety, please remain seated while listening to the Window to the Magic.com podcast. Maybe there's a name for this. Something like Disnotic Obsession. Please visit windowtothemagic.com for more information, or you can find us on Apple Podcasts and in the iHeartMedia app. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Call or text, or you can send us an email to questions at insurancehour.com. If you have missed any part of this show, jump online, go back and get it. It seems like we have done nothing other than questions that have been emailed in, and there are a lot of them, lots of good information. If you missed any, go and check it out. During the break, I I had received a message that somebody called in asking about advertising on the show, and I want to make a point. Uh, I am very picky, to be honest, about who we let advertise on the show, because I think that as I do the best I can to always give you the most accurate information that I can, I can't get behind a company that I don't really believe in. I know, right? I can't make a warranty, I can't guarantee anything that a sponsor says, but I really do want to feel comfortable. So if you are looking to advertise on the show, you can shoot certainly shoot us an email to sponsor at insurancehour.com and, and we can talk. But understand that, uh, this sounds funny, if you're a shady business, probably not gonna let you through, but you know what I'm saying. We try and keep everybody, uh, we try and give everyone the most accurate information, the most current information, and, and we try to keep everybody honest. So I do my best to keep people uh, from advertising with us unless I'm comfortable with them as well. Actually reminds me, I always like to point out at some point during the show that while I do do the best I can to provide you with the most accurate information I can, sometimes I get it wrong. It happens. So if you hear something that does not sound right or you've heard otherwise, please do reach out and let me know because if it turns out that I'm giving you incorrect or outdated information, I want to know about it. And I will definitely put that information back out so everybody can be aware of it. No ego involved here. I want to be sure you're getting the most accurate information that you can. That's my goal. And if I need a little bit of help now and then from some of you, by all means, I welcome it. Let's get back to some of our emails. And, oh, I thought we had a question um, that was calling in, but apparently it was a false alarm. So let's go on to the next question. Question is from Mark in Houston. I've heard that bundling my auto and home insurance with the same company could save you money. How significant are those discounts typically, and are there any downsides? You know, I always get a kick out of this. There was a particular insurance company, I can't think of which it is right now, that started marketing bundle your insurance. And and those of us in the industry started chuckling because we've only been saying that forever. That, that's not a new concept of having your insurance for let's say your property, your home, and your car with the same company. It is not new. We've been doing that since the beginning of time. So to all of a sudden see an insurance company start talking about bundling your insurance as if, oh my gosh, we have revolutionized the industry because we're doing this now, was a little bit funny. In general, when you have your property insurance and your auto insurance with the same insurance company, they will offer you a discount on the price for both of those policies. Sometimes they'll offer you a discount just for one and not the other, but typically they're going to offer you a discount for both. Now, as far as saving money, I don't really see any downside to saving money, but downside to bundling the policies, which is what Mark is asking us, I don't know of any particular downside other than the fact that bundling your policies in the event that one of those policies is an inferior policy to one you can get elsewhere, either by product or by price, you might suffer. So I guess the point is 
Don't bundle them for the sake of bundling if it means you're going to be getting inferior coverage or coverage that you don't think is what you need. Yes, you want to save money. And if you're going to save money, you want to be sure you still are getting the type of coverage that you need. Does that make sense? So bundling is great, but not to the detriment of having the coverage that you're looking for. Let's move on. Um, Natalie from Phoenix. I'm concerned about potential special assessments from my condominium association for repairs. I've heard loss assessment in condo insurance. Can you explain what that is? This is a big one. Condominiums have the ability, the homeowners association, to assess unit owners for certain types of things, right? Now, they might decide to clean out or upgrade their elevators, let's just say, and you can get assessed for that. Now, an insurance policy is not going to pay for that because the building is just deciding to do some upgrades, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. How, how can you potentially have a, po a policy that's going to just pay for you if you arbitrarily decide to do upgrades? Doesn't, doesn't work that way. But an insurance company can offer you loss assessment coverage for things that would be covered under the policy, like let's say fire. So in the event there is a fire, and the HOA says, okay, we need to pay X number of dollars. Maybe that money is going to go toward their deductible for the insurance policy for the association. Maybe they're, they, they're just simply not even going to file the claim. It's under their deductible and they're going to assess all of the unit owners. Based on the insurance policy that you have, your individual condominium owner's policy, you can potentially have coverage to pay for that assessment. Usually the coverage can be up to about $50,000. It depends on the insurance company and what you select. But I think the important takeaway is that loss assessment has to be for a covered loss. It's not for just any assessment. If it's earthquake loss assessment, guess what it's going to pay for? A loss assessment based on an earthquake loss. There is no generic, like I said, coverage for loss assessment for the sake of loss assessment. Doesn't work that way. So yes, loss assessment is a good one to have. It's also good to understand how it works. Next question, Tom from Philadelphia. Hello, Tom. I wonder if any of these people happen to be paying attention right now, or maybe they'll catch it on a replay, who knows? I have a dog that's generally well-behaved. I can see where this is going, well-behaved, but I'm worried about the liability if he ever bites someone. I love how you guys understand liability and are relating that to a dog bite. I'm so impressed. Does my homeowner's insurance coverage cover dog bites and are there any breeds that could be excluded? Wow, great question. The answer is sort of. Your homeowner's insurance policy, if it has liability insurance, and if it does not exclude coverage for animals, then yes, potentially you would be able to put a claim in in the event that your dog that is generally well-behaved does hurt somebody. Now, in the event that happens, understand also that that is a significant liability claim. Those claims can be massive, scary massive. Now, mind you, I'm a dog lover. I'm one of those guys when you're walking your dog down the street, I have to look at it and go, oh, puppy, 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 and try and play with it. So I get it, right? But understand that liability insurance is there to protect you. And unless it's excluded, it will typically be included on a homeowner's or condominium or renter's owner's policy. As far as specific breeds, many insurance companies do have breeds of dogs that they will exclude or they will not write your home insurance at all if you have that dog, which is challenging because it doesn't seem to make sense. Why can I not get homeowner's insurance because I have a particular dog? Now you understand why, because they don't have the ability to exclude the dog. That might be a state regulation. So since they can't exclude the dog and it's a dog on a list that they find is not typically well behaved, they won't offer the homeowner's insurance policy as well. So you might have to do a little bit of work. Now, some carriers will give you the ability to get training documents that show you've had the dog trained, things like that. There are some ways to work around this if you need to. Time for one more break and we will be back. I am Carl Sussman and you are learning from Insurance Hour. See you in 30 seconds. Are you feeling lost in the search for the right insurance? Making call after call, only to find no one willing to go that extra mile for you? At Sussman Insurance Agency, we understand that frustration and we're here to change your experience. Where others see obstacles, we see opportunities. While many might shy away from jumping through hoops, at Sussman Insurance Agency, we are prepared to leap. Looking under every rock, exploring every avenue. That's not just what we do, it's who we are. Our dedicated team doesn't just offer policies, we provide solutions. 
Solutions born from persistence, expertise, and a genuine commitment to finding you the best coverage possible. We don't just meet expectations, we surpass them. If you're tired of hearing no or it's not possible, it's time to turn to a team that believes in yes and let's make it happen. Don't settle for less. Reach out to Sussman Insurance Agency at 877-411-5200. Visit us online at sussmaninsurance.com or email sales at sussmaninsurance.com. Let's uncover the insurance solutions you deserve. Sussman Insurance Agency, going the extra mile every time. Hello, hello. This is Insurance Hour. I am your host, Carl Sussman. Thank you so much for being here today. Phone lines are open, 559-656-0317. Call or text that number anytime, even if the show is not live. We will get your message. Send your questions in to questions at insurancehour.com. Also, if you want to get in our text link, go ahead, send us a text to 567 for carl That's 567 567- 367-5275. In our final segment, we are going through questions that you have sent in, and I want to jump right back in. This question is from Jasmine in New Orleans. She says, given the high risk of hurricanes and flooding here, I'm worried my homeowner's insurance isn't enough. What additional coverage should I consider? Well, that's a great question. Um, New Orleans has certainly had its share of natural disasters. And uh, since you mentioned hurricanes, I, I read an interesting statistic. Do you know that the most recent hurricane, um, I'm blanking out, sorry, Hurricane Helene, would you like to know the number of people that actually had flood insurance, which is, of course, the type of coverage you want to have? About 2%. 2% of people that were in the affected areas had flood insurance. Now, that's horrible, horrible. That means that 98% of people in the affected area do not have insurance coverage. That is, that's mind blowing. So let me address your, your question. Different areas of the country and the world for that matter have different types of exposure, right? California, it might be earthquake insurance. Florida, it might be hurricanes. New Orleans, it might be levees overflowing and flooding, right? It just depends on where you are. Texas was having, or not Texas, Oklahoma was having some insane hail storms that was causing you know, baseball size hail that were hammering people. I mean, just depends on where you are. Now, most homeowners insurance policies, again, they're fairly cookie cut, they're fairly standard, and they will cover certain things. Now, when you're looking at natural disasters, typically there will be things that you have to purchase separately. Flood insurance is one of them. We talked about flood insurance earlier in the show. If you missed it, just jump online, search for insurance hour, find the show, and, and you'll be able to go through and, and get uh, listen to the, t- the topic we talked about for that, for flood insurance. But understand that flood insurance has to be purchased separately. As I just said, only 2% of the people in the affected area had coverage. Earthquake insurance, you have to purchase it separately. Wind insurance in certain states, you have to purchase separately. So insurance policies, again, they are specific and they are generic. The generic policies are the ones you hear about the most. Home insurance, auto insurance, the specific type of coverages for perils that are not, that are, that are unique to certain areas that we wouldn't necessarily want to pay for if we're not in one of those areas. Things like earthquake, flood, wind, those types of things you need to get a separate policy for. What I would recommend you do, Jasmine, is go talk to a local independent insurance agent or broker and say, hey, what do I need? What options are available for me as a homeowner in this city? And find out because every city is going to be a little bit different. And every city and every state and every area is going to have its own unique factors that we need to be concerned about and be sure that we have coverage for. Make sense? All right, let's get to the next one. Um, Luke in San Francisco. I'm renting an apartment and considering renter's insurance. If my laptop gets stolen from my car or someone breaks into my rental apartment, would renter's insurance help? Great question. We talked about this also on an earlier show that things in your car are not typically covered by your car insurance. And I know that makes a lot of people tilt their head and say, what? Yes, car insurance pays for your car. And again, think about it this way. When you're getting a car and an insurance company is pricing the car, they know what the car costs. They can't possibly know what you keep in the car. So it would be impossible for you to be able to have a product price to pay for your car and the stuff since everybody has different stuff in their car, right? Renter's insurance will pay for your stuff, as you're saying. 
it's Luke, right? Luke, it will pay for your stuff, like your laptop. If somebody breaks into your apartment and steals it, there's likely a limit on things like laptops, so double check your policy for that, but it will pay for that. Renter's policies also will typically have something that's called personal property away from home. Guess where that might be? In your car. So if your laptop is in your car and somebody breaks in and steals it, then you would be able to potentially put a claim in for your personal property away from home for your laptop. Boom, 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 right? Now, this is something that's important that we understand because you don't have the entire amount of personal property that you have at home covered away. Typically, it's about 10%. And again, every policy can be a little bit unique. So if you have $100,000 in personal property at home, 10, <coughs> excuse me, you might have $10,000 that's covered away from home. You see how that works? But again, every policy is different. And sometimes you can actually request more. I talked about this also in an earlier show. Be careful when you are leaving things in your car. Don't leave things that are in plain sight. I, I know it's obnoxious and sometimes we're just running in to grab a coffee and we come back. It takes no time whatsoever for somebody to bash the window and steal stuff from your car. Throw your jacket over it, throw your hat over it, toss it under the seat, something. Don't leave things that look attractive. We call them an attractive nuisance. Uh, don't leave them in plain sight because you're just making it easy. If somebody is scoping cars out and they're walking down, they're looking in windows and they see a laptop, I mean, that's pay dirt. That's what they're looking for. They'll smash the window, grab the laptop and be gone in five seconds, literally five seconds. I think we're going to actually do a show at some point about some tips that we can do to try and prevent claims from happening. Because again, the best claim is not to have one. No claim means no loss, means no increase in premium. It's all good for everybody, right? The carriers are happy, you're happy. That's a win-win. So with that, I wanna wrap up today's show. I appreciate everyone being here and listening. If you missed any part of this show, jump online, search for Insurance Hour. There's a web page. it's on YouTube, it's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's where else is it, iHeartMedia, TuneIn, uh, it's everywhere. But again, easy enough, just search for Insurance Hour and you'll find it. This was a great show. I'm so glad for all of your questions that were coming in. We have many, many more. I will keep answering them in future shows. Keep them coming in as well. Keep them fresh. I want to make sure that if you have a question, I can answer it. And if you have that question, chances are other people have that same question as well. Thank you again. This is Insurance Hour. You have been learning from, and I am your host, Carl Sussman. Take care. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 559- 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians, one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. The show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.